Surely. Congressman Kyle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Manafort, could I uh, get you to summarize very briefly for us the uh, relationship between CFM, CDC, and BMSK and describe your individual role and uh, risk in that, please, as, as it relates to this project. Yes, sir. CFM and CDC are joint development company for purposes of the Seabrook project. CFM owns approximately 60 percent of that joint venture, and CDC owns approximately 40 percent. That joint venture had an agreement with Black Manafort, Stone, and Kelly by which Black Manafort, Stone, and Kelly <coughs> provided a variety of services, uh, including government services, federal and state, public relations services, and administrative services. That initial agreement between Black Manafort, Stone, and Kelly and the joint venture was initially between CFM and, the jo and, and BMSK, but when CDC joined into the joint venture, it assumed that uh, agreement as well. And the uh, contract that you had, uh, was that for a fee? There, there was no contract between the joint venture uh, and BMSK of a written nature, sir. There was a verbal understanding that Black Manafort, Stone and Kelly would be paid $326,000, uh, and that amount of money was pegged to the number of units that existed in the project, uh, but, didn't, but didn't define the scope of responsibility. Uh, there was, uh, uh, at some point, I assume, either with you personally or with Black Manafort, an involvement in the joint venture itself rather than just a fee arrangement. Is that correct or incorrect? I'm sorry, I don't understand the question, Congressman. Was there at ever any time a change in that legal uh, relationship where Black Manafort, Stone, and Kelly had uh, some kind of ownership uh, responsibility uh, as opposed to simply a fee arrangement with the jo uh, joint venture? No, sir. Were any of the individual partners of Black Manafort, Stone and Kelly, a part of the joint venture? Just me, sir. You personally were the only one? That is correct. And what was your personal uh, interest in the uh, joint venture? I owned one-third of CFM, which represented 60 percent of the joint venture deal. So you owned uh, 20 percent of the total? That is correct. And uh, is it correct to say then that with respect to the $450,000 that was at risk, the, the liquidated damages uh, represented in the contract, is it correct that uh, your share of that would have been 20 percent? That is correct, sir. Um, uh, would it be accurate to say that uh, that was not an insubstantial amount of money to you? That is accurate, sir. Now, on this matter of risk, um, would it also be accurate to say that all of the risks that you enumerated uh, were acceptable uh, to you personally and, and to the joint venture in terms of uh, uh, a business decision to proceed. That is correct, sir. Let's go through uh, I each of these. Uh, the financing depended upon the award of the contract, but you expected to get that, so you expected to get the financing. Is that correct? Even with the subsidy, Congressman, the financing was a question mark. Certainly we felt that the subsidy would provide the stream of income flow to justify a construction loan and permanent financing. But to say that by virtue of just receiving the subsidy we felt we could get financing would be inaccurate. It wasn't a sure thing, but a probability? Would that be a good it, way to In put fact, it? several, we, we made, made several applications for financing, and I don't, I don't remember how many, uh, but one or two of them were rejected. Uh, the building code could be a problem, but I gather you uh, also deemed that to be an acceptable risk. We deemed it an acceptable risk, but it certainly was a, a situation which we felt was very important because if we couldn't get a rehab plan approved, then we could never get building permits to start the project and we would find ourselves in a very difficult situation. And uh, did this approval have to come from people who have been described, uh, that is to say the community which has been described as less than enthusiastic about the project? <coughs> I don't know who has been described as less than enthusiastic, but it had to come from the mayor and the, and the city council and, All right, and the that's a fair building answer. officials. Um, and finally, with regard to the possibility of the other developer or the other owner getting involved, uh, that was always a possibility. You understood that risk, but uh, as Mr. Cruz just testified, uh, you didn't have any specific reason to think that he might try to move, move in on the deal. Not to move in, but we understood clearly that he had Section 8 certificates for the project, therefore he had to have some knowledge of the fact that programs existed, 
uh, for funding purposes uh, for, the, for the, uh, the, the units. As a result, we didn't know what knowledge he had, but even that minimal amount of knowledge caused us concern, which is why we didn't disclose to him what the intentions were of our development plan. And this is the same person who would get to keep the $450,000 if you didn't get the award. Precisely. Uh, it, it, he could have chosen at any time not to extend the option. And we didn't have our financing lined up, and so the units might have hit the public housing authority. The public housing authority might have applied, might have advertised, and we might not have had uh, control of the project, and he would have been able to apply for the project. But if, if it were his decision not to extend the option, the liquidated damage clause presumably would not have been properly invoked. Isn't that correct? We would have received our money back, but right. he would have had the project. That's right. correct. Um, Mr. Chairman, this is, a, this is an interesting... Um, um, uh, matter here because it, on this whole matter of of, uh, of risk, the, the idea of subsidized housing, of course, was to remove the risk uh, so that a developer would rehabilitate a project, and that's the reason for the uh, the subsidies to, to to cover the risk. Um, so, Mr. Manafort, if you had a risk, um, in this case, it was because you had to put dollars at risk in order to acquire the property to have it available should you get the award. That was the nature of your risk. That was it? the nature of one of the risks, yes, Congressman. As I said, the other risk included the financing as well as the, the rehab plan being approved. I, I understand. All of those are wrapped into the same total risk, which is that you had to put your money at risk in order to have a a hold on the property that could be used should the award be granted. Yes, sir. Uh, and you were willing to take this risk because of the potential payout. We were able to take that risk because we viewed the project as a good project. Yes, sir. We, we well, yield no. For a yeah, let, let, let me just, uh, because the answer wasn't quite, uh, if the, 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 the potential payout here was quite large compared to the amount of money you had at risk. That's, that's my point. Is that correct or incorrect? Uh, I don't know that that's correct, Congressman. I mean, it, it, it's impossible to speculate what the profits, which is I think what you're getting at, would have been for that project. Uh, and in fact, uh, you know, the proceeds that were, uh, were the result of the syndication, for example, have already been plowed back into the project. Uh, I have indicated in previous testimony that I believe that the proceeds of the syndication would have been $921,000. If the rehab would have gone without having to deal with the proceeds of the syndication, then one could make the case that we were risking $450,000 to get a return of $921,000, but that's too simplistic because we don't know what other change orders have been required or the risk would have been required. Uh, and so it would be speculative on my part to give you an exact dollar number comparing risk versus profit. Well, uh, Mr. Chairman, let me ask one final question. Please. I'd be happy to yield to you. My, my point here is that, that this is rather high stakes, and I assume that, uh, that as a result of the uh, relatively high stakes here, the potential for loss and the potential for gain, that you uh, did have to do everything that you could legally I presume, within your power to try to make sure that you got this award. That is correct, Congressman. I'd be happy to. Well, I just wanted to <clears throat> read into the record the statement under oath by Mr. William Connolly, Director of Housing for the State of New Jersey. With regard to the Seabrook project, uh, first we were aware of it, it was November 18, 1986. <clears throat> Mr. Greg Stevens had called and he wanted to come the following morning and meet with us regarding a rehabilitation project. The next day at 11.30 in the morning, Victor Cruz met with Mr. Ziegler in our offices in Trenton. They indicated they had a commitment from HUD for the Seabrook project. Now, that seems to me to eliminate risk. And um, although I... I, please. W where are you reading? I'm sorry. Are you reading on page two of the excerpt, excerpt of transcript, uh, the first line about Mr. Connolly? I think I'm reading from page 186. But statements of this type appear repeatedly in Mr. Connolly's, Mr. Ziegler's testimony. Yeah, no, I know. 
you, so you're reading on line 4494, Congressman? 4494 and 4495? I'll, I'll, I'll find the reference for you. I'll be happy to yield back the time. I'll give it to you in a second. The, the, the point I think the Chairman is getting to is, is uh, that um, before you uh, uh, made the commitment on the $450,000 option, you had uh, received word from the local housing authority that it had received word from Washington. I don't recall the exact words, but the bottom line was that it looked pretty good to get this housing. Uh, Prospects were pretty good uh, for it, isn't I, that I, correct? I I think Mr. Cruz can best deal with this, but I would simply draw attention to the uh, panel, the subcommittee on line 4502 on page 187 when Mr. Ziegler corrects Mr. Connolly's statement and says that Mr. Cruz indicated there were HUD secretarial discretionary funds available, not committed, for the project at Seabrook, which is a distinct difference from what Mr. Connolly said, and as Mr. Connolly testified, he was not in the meeting, Mr. Ziegler was in the meeting. And Mr. Cruz also was in the meeting and can testify as to that conversation. But, uh, but, Mr. Manafort, it was good enough for you to put this $450,000 at, at risk. Yes, Congressman. As I referred to earlier in my testimony, we had received a letter on March the 30th from the Public Housing Authority which indicated two facts. Number one, that they found our project feasible. And number two, that they were expecting an award from HUD which they thought you know, could be made available to our, to our project, which gave us some sense of confidence. Uh, additionally, we had no choice because on April 1, our option expired and we had to negotiate with the seller so that we found ourselves in a situation if we couldn't tie the property down further, that process was going to go on and we were going to be out of the picture. That led to the 4-9 agreement with the seller that provided the risk of $450,000 as liquidated damages. Is there any doubt in your mind that uh, your contacts and your firm's uh, uh, political clout um, had a lot to do with the uh, ultimate award of the contract to the joint venture? Uh, I can't speculate as to the amount of influence uh, that, that led to that award. Certainly, in my firm's reputation uh, you know, was a factor in it. Would it be fair to say that, that you had a, a, a better shot at, at getting the award um, than, let's just say, an average lawyer from an average community uh, coming in without the kind of contacts that you had? Congressman, I, I'm not going to speculate. I don't know what an average lawyer is. In this town, no one claims to be an average lawyer. Well, I, I was not referring to necessarily uh, a lawyer in this community, and I realize that's totally... I'm not trying to be... Trying no, no, to be I, 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 I know you're not, and it's totally hypothetical and speculative, and my question would never be allowed in a court of law. But I, I'm, I'm just trying to get a sense here uh, on this matter of risk, it seems to me evident that you had a lot at stake. That's and as a result, you were going to work very hard to get it. Absolutely. And uh, that probably, uh, as a result of your skill and your efforts and your context and your political clout, all of them combined, uh, those, those had a significant influence on the award of this particular contract. Yes, sir, as well as the need that Mr. Connolly referred to and the merits of the project as well. I, I think they all wrapped together in, in the process. Gentlemen, yield to me. Uh, surely. Yeah. I, I don't know why the, there's, there's such sensitivity to the use of certain language around here. Mm -hmm. Mr. Manafort, in the last time you, you appeared before us, you said on your own, well, you volunteered that on the basis of a narrow interpretation, what you did wouldn't, could in fact be accurately described as influence peddling. Uh, C Congressman, I said you might interpret it as that. I called it lobbying, if you refer back to my testimony. And what I was trying to do then, and, and it will attempt to do now, is not get into that debate because that's a definitional debate. And I don't think that advances the subject of this committee's in, uh, investigation. Well, well as a matter of fact, I th it seems to me that, that that's exactly what this committee's investigation is about, whether, in fact, decisions were made on the merits, whether it was made, they were made on the basis of who could peddle the most influence. That's really what a lot of this, in, this inquiry is about. Thank you very much. For uh, uh, you're very welcome. And I'll just conclude uh, kind of on that same point. It's, it seems to me that as we... Um, as we understand that, that decisions were undoubtedly made based at least in part on influence, um, we have to ask ourselves the question what the best kind of program is. And from the cost standpoint to the taxpayers, from the standpoint of who receives the benefits, uh, the best quality projects, the right kind of prioritization, and so on. And it is increasingly clear to me, uh, Mr. Chairman, that the subsidy program is not the best way to achieve this. Uh, the subsidy program is supposed to take risk out of the equation. But the way that this program has worked in the past, a different kind of risk was put into the equation. And it was the kind of risk that was characterized here. 
where in order to uh, take advantage of the relatively um, um, uh, high stakes, I, I, I would put it, um, people did put money at risk to be sure, but as a result of that, then had to make darn sure that they didn't lose their investment. And when that happens in the political arena, as opposed to the market, I think it suggests a problem, a problem that we should deal with. And uh, I would conclude by saying this probably ought to point us in the direction of reform of this, pro of this particular program and perhaps others, uh, so that uh, what we're talking about is risk that's based upon the market rather than risk that's based upon politics. I want to thank my colleagues. Let me just say that as one who taught economics for 30 years, I view risk-taking as a very important function of the entrepreneurial system. There was no risk taken here. This was a greased sweetheart deal where all the participants knew what the final outcome would be. The director of housing for New Jersey says they weren't surprised that the units were awarded on a project-specific basis. And I think to use the word risk is, uh, is uh, uh, doing damage to the English language. There was no risk here. There was a prearranged deal which went through as it was prearranged. And, um, and uh, the, the claims of risk, I find, uh, uh, not to be substantiated by the reality. As a matter of fact, um, there is no point going through Mr. Connolly's and Mr. Ziegler's testimony again. They were stunned when, when these folks came in and told them they had the units. Uh, they were told not to apply to the proper regional housing authority, go directly to Mr. Monticello. They were told to send a blind carbon copy to Deborah Dean. And lo and behold, the project came through just as it was advised it would come through. Uh, there were no other participants, there was no other competition, there were no other applicants. And when the ads were put in the local paper, no one else responded. I mean, nothing could be, could be less risky than this. And, uh, and I find um, the, the, the constant reference to the, to the entrepreneurial risk function um, uh, to be ludicrous. There was no risk here. Uh, uh, there, was a, there was a sweetheart deal with Deborah Dean that was implemented and stands implemented. The sideshow that they failed to put in uh, uh, gutters is, is just deplorable. That they failed to put in refrigerators is just deplorable. Uh, Deborah Dean promised them the units, and she delivered on the units. And that, those are the facts. We are not talking about some future development. We are reviewing past history. We are reviewing past history. Uh, Congressman uh, Martinez. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I don't want to beat a dead horse, but I'm still stuck on risk and how much risk there was. Uh, from the very beginning, this whole idea, this whole proposal was based on uh, securing the number of units needed to rehab this project, right? As I indicated, Congressman, a conventional uh, development didn't appear to make economic sense which is why Mr. Cruz concluded that a mod no. rehab program would. All right. That's my point exactly. What people have invested, and I understand speculation, I really do, and you know, it's, any speculation has a certain amount of risk in it, but uh, people who are usually successful think very carefully about how much risk they're going to take, and when they look at an investment to make, they want to know that if it's going to cost them X number of dollars, there's going to be a reasonable return on that investment and uh, they always weigh that against what it's going to cost, what they're going to have to put. And uh, that's the normal conventional situation you're talking about, but uh, in this I don't think there was any consideration from the beginning and what you just, the way you've just answered me was not the direct way I would have liked to have been answered, that no Yes, this was, from the very beginning, this whole concept was based on the availability of rehab units. <clears throat> but uh, I'll take it that your answer did mean that, because it really did. But the, the part that bothers me is that, uh, and I think it bothers a lot of us on the, on the committee, that if we asked you or any other 
bright entrepreneur to invest their money in a conventional system without government subsidy. And they looked at this project, they'd say no. They'd say no, wouldn't they? Uh, uh, we would have. I can't speculate as to others, sir. See, that's the point that really is the bottom line here, but, is but that the only reason this thing was entered into to begin with is because there was going to be a government subsidy. C Congressman, if I might just suggest, the whole purpose of the MOD rehab program, as I understand it, was to encourage developers to take some risk and to develop low and moderate income housing where, where without the, uh, the enticement, they wouldn't be willing to enter yeah. into a conventional program. You're right. You're and absolutely right. And that comes back to the question of risk. And, a, and a, if without the subsidy, there is risk. With the subsidy, the risk is minimized. So the project would have never been entered into or even entertained unless there was a reasonable assurance of obtaining those Co units. Congressman, there are, there are various levels of risk at various times. Fr frankly, the end of this process may define the, all of the steps that happened beforehand, but b b by virtue of the fact that we were successful in securing the subsidy and we were successful in getting the AHAP signed, it now looks as if all the events that preceded it were just going to happen. In fact, as, as I, I know people here would agree, you know, this was a complex transit business transaction and I can understand why it would be subject to different interpretations. But the fact is that during the process, during the process, we had various levels of risk at various times. It, the risk changed along the way. After we got the units awarded to us conditionally on June 1, that risk was minimized. But we still had the risk of getting, getting project financing. And as I indicated, I don't remember the number, but we had several applications rejected because the financial institutions didn't want to do low-income housing. Uh, and they had a prejudice against it as well. So we had to ultimately find somebody who understood the program and who agreed philosophically with it and was willing to put the money up with, uh, you know, with us back, backing it up and being secure. And that's a risk that really hasn't been dealt with. But financial institutions don't like to deal with, uh, with low-income housing either in many instances. Uh, so the, the risk switched on June 1, if you will, from the subsidy question to the financing question. In between that and, and the closing, we had a risk in dealing with the local community. And, and we may have misjudged some of the impressions uh, that they, they would have had, although we didn't do anything wrong in the process in which we approached it. But they then became a real, uh, a real player in it at a very critical time in the process. That presented a risk. We could have gotten to the stage where the, the local community said, this is the greatest rehab program in the world. We had the conditional award from the Public Housing Authority, and we couldn't have gotten financing, and we'd have lost all of our money. You know, I think you can say, because you were turned down by some financial institutions, that there was a certain amount of risk. But uh, in reality, you eventually got financing. And I think that if, uh, with the uh, fact that you did have the subsidized housing unit, uh, the number of units, uh, that, that risk wasn't that great. But that that's, can be debated. Never, nevertheless, what interests me a lot, too, is the fact that part of the risk that you describe and or part of the complications you describe is dealing with the local community as far as their building code. As far as I know, most local communities, city councils and mayors, have established by federal law a general plan. In that general plan, they've outlined what the zones are in the city and what the building code is. What they can exceed state requirements, but they cannot go below that. And if a local community has established the billing codes and going into this project, you must have certainly been aware or your, your project people sh must, should have investigated, if not. Uh, uh, Mr. Cruz. Uh, Congressman, uh, this community did not have, uh, had not adopted the Boca Code for rehabilitation. They were in the process of adopting it sometime towards the end of August. Uh, and they passed that ordinance in the beginning of September, at which time they were also hiring a housing code official. Now, subsequent to that, they have passed additional ordinances, uh, which have, have required us to do additional work. And based upon my understanding, uh, and, I, and I have gotten this understanding. Well, let me interrupt you right there, because you know, I've listened to your testimony. I watched your testimony on this particular subject from my office because I was doing other work there. And I, I want the public that's out there that might be watching this to understand how a city really works. There is a building code in place, and that building code exists for all rehab building or any kind of reconstruction to any building. That's a fact. What happens in the case of uh, rehabbing housing for 
government subsidized housing is that there may have to be a variance from that code that exists. And in order that rather than gain a variance on every specific unit, they will then entertain as a city council to develop a code specifically for that rather than granting the grants. And that's probably what happened here. I would like to talk to the mayor and ask him, but I'm almost positive that that's what happened. And in developing that, you may have been not at that particular time clearly understanding of what that would entail, but you know what it really entailed was a relieving of certain parts of the code for this specific kind of housing. I've, I've been on city council, I served eight years on city council, I know that's exactly, and I served eight years on a planning commission, I know exactly that's the process. What I'm saying here is that regardless of all that, any of that new code would have been to an advantage, except that they would have still required you at the very minimum to do those things as the curbs and gutters that minimize risk to property. All right? Congressman, I, I don't disagree with what you said. What I was trying to uh, provide you was what this particular community, once they were aware of the project and were involved in the project, decided to go beyond what were the building codes and the BOCA regulations that were enforced. They specifically passed ordinances that related to this, not, not just this project, but they passed ordinances that affected directly this project. And the result of that is that we have had to do a substantial amount of additional work which has cost us a substantial amount of additional dollars. That's the only information I was going to provide. Yeah, I, I'm glad you said not this specific project because city councils are forbidden by law to pass, pass something specifically for one project. It has to be a general code. But that aside, you know, the, the situation is this, that when you come in with a project in a city, within a city's jurisdiction, you have to apply for a permit. That's correct. And when you apply for that permit, that city is aware of what you're going to do and how you're going to do it. That's correct. And the, the Supreme Court has already ruled that in a specific instance of an unusual kind of a project, that the city has a right to do exactly what you said they're for the protection of the community. They're doing it. And they're doing it. So I don't think that's anything abnormal or anything that, that's unreasonable. I think in the con issuing of the uh, Temporary uh, building uh, occupancy permits, uh, when I was listening to the testimony, it would give, give people watching a feeling that the city was doing something uh, in, in a determined effort to curtail the project. I doubt that very much. I think these local city officials are very responsible, and they're just making sure that the project is developed in such a way that it isn't a detriment to the community and ends up in really run-down housing in the future. But let me get on to something else. You, you mentioned in your testimony a while ago that uh, you wanted to altruistically do something for the 300 people that were living in substandard housing, 300 families that were living in substandard housing. Uh, how much were those people paying rent when they were in that substandard housing? You know? For fear that I may give you an incorrect answer, Congressman. Give me an approximate so that. I think they You're were paying tight. between two fifty to three hundred and fifty dollars. Two fifty or three hundred dollars. That's good. Now you're taking these people out of these houses and these three hundred families you're referring to. How many of those three hundred families are now in the units you you've completed? I don't know what the number is, Congressman. Do you have any idea if any that were living there before are living there now? There are probably some that are living there uh, since we started the rehabilitation. But you must remember that. Once we found that asbestos in uh, 1987, it called for the removal of the, the occupancies. What we tried to do was get some units complete and have like a hotel situation on site in which we could move families to those units while we were doing the rehab. Let's say that, uh, and we'll give you a, a good percentage, the 50 percent of the 300 families that were living there are now moving back into the new units. I doubt that, but let's say that just for our... Congressman. The latest information I have was when we testified last, but at that time there were 162 units occupied. Uh, it's now, I believe, 182 or, or approximately. At that time, I testified, and Mr. Connolly subsequently testified, that only three tenants of those 162 did not meet the income test. In other words, could not live there and get a mod rehab subsidy. However, of those three, all three of them chose, because they could afford it, to live there and to pay the additional rent themselves, taking them out of the program. 
I don't know how that uh, really affects what I'm asking. I'm not asking about any particular family, what they could or couldn't afford at that particular time. But I'm asking about the original 300 families, if any of them. The statement was earlier that we wanted to do something for those 300 families, give them adequate housing at a reasonable rent that they could afford. And the, the point I'm making here is that how many of those 300 families have moved in to the new units? We don't know. Yeah, I guess that I mean, my impression, but it, it's it's purely that is that most of those 162 were tenants that had been removed, relocated, and then brought back. But that is an assumption. Well, I'd like to find that out later. But I'm saying, let's say there's 50 percent. Okay. They used to pay $250 a month rent to $300 a month rent. They are now paying over seven hundred dollars a month rent. That is not correct, Congressman. What is? What are they paying now? They pay if they qualify for the Section Eight Mod Rehab Program. They pay thirty percent of whatever their. Oh, I know is. that. Yeah, I'm not saying that. I'm saying what the rents are now. What are the rents now? Uh, they uh, they differ from bedroom size. Well, give me from the range from to from. Uh, uh, we may have those figures here. Uh, for one bedroom, Congressman, $522. For two bedrooms, $605. And for three bedrooms, $756. But I think it's important to note, Congressman, that that includes, number one, the 20 percent FMR mod rehab increment that is the basis of the subsidy program. Uh, and number two, that those are for units that have been rehabilitated, not for the dilapidated units that they were living in prior to our involvement. But it doesn't include the refrigerator. I'm sorry? It doesn't include the refrigerator. I don't know that for a fact. I've heard the testimony, and I've made a note to find that out, sir. All right. But the rent is substantially increased, is the point. And here's the point I'm coming to. Do you think any of those 300 families would have been able to live there had it not been for the subsidized rent that they only paid, like, as you said, 30 percent of their... The new rent? ...of their net income? Would any of them have been able to afford it? Not if they qualified for the program. Because they would they, not have been able to. No, because if they qualify for the program, they have to have uh, an income that indicates they are 50 percent below the medium income of that area. And this is why the program is designed. It's designed to provide right. low-income people with the decent, safe, and affordable housing, the rehabilitated housing. Uh, c Congressman, one uh, of the confusions. What, the point is this, and, and I'm, I'm going to come to the point right now because I think we get into these things and we beat them to death and it really doesn't accomplish anything. The fact is that if there had not been the program as you just were alluding to, this whole project would not have been viable because those same people would not have been able to live in those units at that price. And I doubt that anybody that wasn't living in a, in a subsidi on a subsidized federal housing unit would rent those things at that price, and you wouldn't have had a project. So the real bottom line is here that the only way the project is viable is for that federal housing, which comes back to there was no risk. You wouldn't have taken, you wouldn't have got into the situation if it hadn't been for that big carrot, and that's the big carrot. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Congressman Martinez. Congressman Shays. We've had about 17 hearings, and one of the things that became eminently clear in the very beginning, and it really wasn't, after that it's, it's not news anymore, but, but it seems to me that it's at the very center of what we're looking at. Probably most of what happened at HUD that we don't like was not illegal, uh, but in some cases it really smells. There's something about it that's just not right. There's something about it that's just not fair. We had the Inspector General say, well, we don't know if rules were laws were broken or regulations. <clears throat> Subsequently, we found that regulations were broken because they hadn't been vacated when you decide how money was to be allocated for mod rehab. I have a friend of mine who has 8,000 units of housing. He stopped building mod rehab before 1984. And he said, at one time, we were giving out like 100,000 units. And some of it was always political. He used a figure of 10%. He said 10% were political. So maybe 10,000 of these units were political, in his words. Um, he said the problem was, though, that as things got squeezed and it got lower and lower and there weren't these uh, vast number of housing units given out under the Carter administration, that, that the political people still wanted their 10% their of the total amount. They still wanted their 10,000 10, units. And, and what he also said to me, which I found interesting, he said when, you, when, the, rent subs when the tax credits were increased from 4% to 9%, he said that's really where the money was at. 
and everybody wanted that the tax credits of nine percent that that was money up front um, let me ask you this question first isn't it true that 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 the cash flow getting money up front um, happens from the tax credit and not from the rent subsidy you can syndicate and so on when you syndicate there's usually a, a schedule upon which the syndication proceeds are paid there's an amount at the at the closing of the syndication and then usually you know it's, it's a, another amount each year uh, and there are ways to discount those notes if you will and take the money early but pay a penalty for taking the money early but in terms of cash flow, the rent subsidy uh, takes place over a 15-year period. Isn't that correct? That is correct. But the tax credit can be upfront money to those who syndicate. Pursuant to what I just discussed, mm -hmm. yes, sir. And uh, would you also agree that there was a significant difference from the 4% tax credit to the 9%? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, I mean, that's really no secret. I mean, that's really a significant part of making these, these projects work. Um, We've looked at consultants. We've, we've had um, uh, the former Interior Secretary come in, and he, he made $1,000 per unit. I mean, it's no secret, is it, uh, as well, that, that on the open market, these were going for about $1,000 a unit. I mean, it, between 1000 and 2000 I mean, that wasn't, for those who were competing, they knew that this is what was happening. Isn't that true? Yes, sir. Yeah. We also are looking at people uh, organizations like yourself that have been extraordinarily successful um, and uh, and in no way have I ever seen anything related to your activity that would suggest any illegalities and I want to say that to you but you have been extraordinarily successful in influencing um, Congress in influencing the executive branch and decisions that's why people hire you because you do a good job and um, and it would be unfair to single you out as if you're the only uh, group that does this. Everybody in this place is involved in influence peddling. And as I use the term, trying to influence. They are peddling, that has a bad term, but they are, they are saying we can make a difference. You hire us, we can change, help try to change the law, we can lobby Congress and we get lobbied. We can lobby the executive branch. I mean, that's what happens down here, isn't that true? Yes, sir, although I do feel singled out. Pardon me, in this sense, um, you have been singled out because you have been extraordinarily successful, it appears, it, with one area, with HUD. And the question is, you know, um, what should we do to make sure that everybody has the same shot at, at a project? Uh, and and what, what changes should we make? I mean, I see us eliminating some programs. I see us changing others. I see us creating some new ones. I see us tightening the regulations. I see us uh, doing things like that. Um, uh, very honestly, we want to make your job more difficult. We don't want you to be as successful. Um, and it seems to me that, that um, uh, one of the things that, that really stuck with me the last time was that you left nothing to chance. Um, you don't want risk. Uh, you, you left nothing by chance. For instance, when you met with the community development people in the state of New Jersey, and I think, my God, Black, Manafort, Stone, and Kelly is so well known that you could have just called yourself and set up that meeting. But, but instead, you chose to have someone who had worked in the governor's office and, in a sense, cut him in on part of the deal, have to pay him something. But you made sure you had the best to set up that meeting. Isn't that true? I mean, what, didn't you, in an arrangement with the community development people, didn't you hire someone from uh, Governor Kane's office, a former... Mr. Stevens was already working for us, and since he was working for us, it was natural that he would be the entree okay. point. So this was someone you already had working for Yes, that's correct. He had done some other projects before in New Jersey? I don't know if he was doing New Jersey projects, but he was involved in some of the political work that the firm was doing. Mm -hmm. But obviously a, a better choice to set up the meeting for him to do it than someone like yourself who may not have any dealings in New Jersey. We felt he understood New Jersey. He would understand the people. Right. Yes, sir. The... Um, the other type of, of organization uh, situation we're looking at is we're looking at the revolving door. People who worked at HUD, like Philip Wynn and Philip Abrams, both FHA commissioners, one an undersecretary. Lance Wilson, who's the chief of staff, and J. Michael Queenan, all of them former HUD employees who in the course of 11 months did much better than you all. Uh, they got over 1,000 units uh, in 11 months. 
to the tune of $138 million <coughs> of rent subsidies and tax credits. And some of those individuals, all of them, appears to have waited the year or, or the two years that they may have had to wait. It appears that way. So they, they may not have broken the law in that instance. We don't know. We're looking into that. Um, we're also looking at the political and career employees, the ones who are actually at HUD. The career employees who, by allowing someone to sign off on a project like at Durham, they get a promotion. Uh, whether they're career employees or whether they're political appoint, uh, employees. Do you have any former HUD employee, do you have anyone on your organization now that used to work at HUD? Mr. Gay formerly w was a consultant at HUD, yes sir. Do you have any employees who used to work for you who now work for HUD? I can't think of any. Congressman, but I haven't, I wasn't prepared for that question. Well, so I, um, let me just say this. What I'd like is for you to give us a list of any of your employees that may now be working at HUD. And let me say this to you. It, it, there may be no relationship whatsoever. Uh, everyone is free to work wherever they want. Uh, we are constantly uncovering memos. My, my suspicions would start to increase if I found that there was communication between uh, HUD officials who were former employees of yours or not. Uh, and so that's why it would be helpful. Could you, you said your basic relationship with Deborah Gordeen was um, uh, professional in the sense of political, but there was so, some social contact. Um, would it be your testimony that, um, did Deborah Gordeen ever advise you of projects uh, or opportunities that you could involve your company in before they would become advertised for the general public? Not to my recollection, Congressman. Did Lance Wilson ever do that? Not to my recollection. Have you had any contact with Lance Wilson? Uh, I, cannot re I don't recall that I ever met Lance Wilson, sir. So. Okay. How about Tom Demery? Did Tom Demery ever let you know of any projects that you might want to get involved in? I, I know Mr. Demery, but I cannot recall any instance where he gave me an advanced knowledge. Um, Linda Murphy is someone who's come before us, a very active law firm down here. Do you, does uh, any organization you're involved in have a business relationship with uh, Linda Murphy? Uh, at the present time, no, sir. Okay. She did serve. She, she, she did serve as bond bond counsel to CDC when they were doing the syndication proceeds, uh, syndication plan. Okay. For which project? For the Seabrook project. So Linda Linda Murphy was involved in in the um, Seabrook. Project. She was the bond counsel to CDC, and what that meant I don't know what role she played in Could it. Could you tell us what the, the tax credits were for Seabrook? I believe they were ten million dollars. So. Who was the, um, where did you get your financing for Seabrook? I'll have to get you that. I don't know who ultimately was the, gave us the permanent financing. Okay. I'll have to. But was it HUD financed at all? I mean. No, no, no. There's no HUD financing. It's all. But it was a private organization? Private. Yes, sir. But in terms of um, a, a $10 million syndication, what would be the fee that would be paid to an organization like Linda Murphy's? I don't know that. No, no, I'm sorry. I was just been, it's not a $10 million syndication. The, syndication, the tax proceeds were $10 million, uh, the tax credits. The syndication was about $2 million. The syndication was $3 million, $300,000-some-odd-thousand. Uh, $3 million what, I'm sorry? Again, Congressman, I want to give you the correct figure, so right. it would probably be better if I got no, you the specific. I, I'll, I'll accept the range and, and, and understand. About 3.3 million. Okay. Now, explain the 10 million figure again for me. That was the tax credit that is available over the life of the project, but now you're getting into an area that uh, exceeds my knowledge. Okay. So, are we saying the upfront <clears throat> money was the 3.3 million? No, that is this. That is the proceeds from the syndication. So in other words, uh, there, I can't explain technically how you package the tax well, credits. Well, that's what I mean by the proceeds. In other words, in syndicating, did, did, you, did you have available in cash flow $3.3 million? Over, over no. the life of the no. syndication, no? no? Absolutely not. Okay. Do you want me to answer that, Congressman? Sure. Out of the syndication uh, proceeds, uh, the $3.3 million, which is done over a period of five to seven years, in which individual taxpayers buy individual units of uh, tax credits. That money comes in, they pay uh, a portion each year for maybe five to seven years. To put the syndication together, you have to hire professionals. You hire lawyers, you hire accountants, 
you hire publishing companies, you hire various number of professionals. And all of their fees have to be paid out of that syndication mm -hmm. proceeds. So uh, I can't specifically tell you the amount that was paid to professionals, although it was a very large amount that was paid to professionals. But the proceeds do not come in all at once. They come in over a five to seven year period. What generally happens, what can happen, is uh, these investors sign notes. And once they sign the notes, uh, you can discount the, the loan. However, uh, very seldom do you want to discount count the loans because you lose so much money if you do that. And that's generally how it, how it happens. The, um, the, the reason why I asked about Linda Murphy was that um, uh, even after she left HUD, there was uh, Mr. Barksdale thought she still worked there because he saw her around so much. And it's fair to say that, that, um, that in a sense, Linda Murphy has a vested interest in what happened to this project, clearly, in the sense that she, she be, has the opportunity to syndicate it. So it, would, it, would it be fair to say um, that, uh, well, I don't even need to ask it. <laughs> um, did you, um, do we have a complete list of all HUD-related projects now? To the best of my knowledge, Congressman, I've agonized long and hard in every the list that I've given to you is as complete from our records as it can be, and it lists all clients of ours uh, that uh, we had going back to 1980 when the first company was, was started. With, um, when you came and testified, there were five projects that we became evident of. I'm not going to ask you the specific ones now. You then wrote a letter of July 11th in which you talked about six more, and we were up to now... 11. And then um, the chairman of your organization, Mr. Panuzio, Mr. Panuzio, wrote a letter on the 13th saying the July 11th letter wasn't complete. And you've explained why. You've explained why. Um, your July 18th letter then discloses 10 more. And just for clarification, the reason why these 10 more, which go back in earlier years, uh, you're saying because you reorganized your organization, that's, you didn't look back that far for those other 10 projects? Yeah. It was actually a new, Black Man for Stone and Kelly was a new company, Congressman. I'll give you a little bit of history, which may explain why we didn't. No, I, you don't need to give me, unless you want to, but my, my question is that basically, you, are you saying that it was a different company? Black Man for Stone and Kelly was formed in December of 1984. Okay. Uh, and that's when we frankly added, De Mr. Kelly was made a Democrat, uh, uh, and we added several Democrats to our firm and, and professionalized it to focus principally on lobbying. Uh, prior to that, the predecessor company started off as a political consulting company where the partners were simply Mr. Black, Mr. Stone, and myself. And it did some lobbying work, but the nature of the company would have been principally de defined as a political consulting company. Uh, between 1980 and 1984, that the nature of the business began to change. And in 1984, after the presidential elections, uh, we had made a business decision to create a lobbying company to bring in professionals from the, hit, from the Congress, uh, as well as from, uh, uh, from the legal profession, and f formalize it as a lobbying entity. Mm -hmm. And the S July 11th letter that I submitted to you, in all instances except one, captured uh, the, uh, you know, the the clients that had been a part of Black Man Was Stone that the, the one project? Was the Waterbury project? No, th th yes, sir. Yeah. So, because that, that's the one in in the um, in your letter of the 18th, it's the one um, that seems to be in 1986 after uh, your firm had been reorganized. That, that is correct. Okay. Sir. And, and the reason that wasn't caught is because we were paid no fees, and as a result, we didn't catch it in the financial review. In other words, you received no financial benefit at all from that, from that project. project. And as a result, we didn't catch it in the review of our financial <coughs> records, uh, and that was the reason that, that one was excluded from the 7-Eleven letter. Yeah. The, um, there was a reference to a project in the Hartford Current of October 1st, which you probably have read, and it made reference to a Riviera Beach project in Florida. Um, explain to me if, if that's 
something we should be concerned with or not? Uh, I, I don't believe so, Congressman. What that was is uh, the developer, Mr. Wadsworth, was somebody who I had disclosed we had done work for, and he, they asked us to make an inquiry at HUD as to the status of a pending uh, uh, project, and we made a phone call for them and communicated that information. We were paid no fees, never anticipated any fees. Why would you have done that? I we we had a contract. We had a personal or a business relationship with him in the past, and he asked us. We making inquiries is normal part of business for us. Can I? You just started to say something. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but you said you had a contract with him. Um, at least that's what I thought yeah. you started. Well, to say. and I corrected myself only because we there. I think they were verbal in one instance and, and written in another for different projects. Let and me so ask you this question: Did you have? Do you, are you involved in any projects for a client in which you're on a retainer? Um, did you include all the projects that you would be, uh, I mean, it, it's obvious that you would be hired on retainer to just look out for interest. Is it possible that people call you up periodically and say, check out this project for us? You mean that we, that we don't have a financial relationship with our client? No, you have a, 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 you know, a continual. Yes, yes. Another, let me be clear on this, because this is an important point. I'd, I, I want to give you time to answer it. Um, do you, are you on retainer for any firm in which you have taken, have been requested by that firm or individuals to um, look out for a project that they may be involved in, like this particular one? Uh, in other words, with the, with, with the Riviera Project, Beach Project, who was the developer? Uh, Mr. Wadsworth, Mr. Oslander. We have five clients presently, Congressman. I think I, I want to answer the question right. fully, and maybe this will answer it. We have five clients presently that are retainer clients for whom, among other things, we have done HUD work in the past. Okay. Um, but we, not for which we were necessarily hired to do HUD work. So I, I think that's what you're asking. I am asking that, but it, it, um, it, it raises this question. Are you, um, with those five people, that you, for, are they firms? Individuals? What are well, one of them is the government of Puerto Rico, okay. uh, for example. Another one is the city of Camden. Uh, another one is the Atlantic City Casino Association. Another one is Nova University. I'm sorry, we can't hear you. Uh, I'm sorry. I mean, I'll just list them. The Atlantic City Casino Association, right. the city of Camden, uh, the government of Puerto Rico, Nova University, and the Mortgage Insurance Corporation of America. So while if they have a particular problem with HUD or any other agency, uh, your job is to, to, to contact HUD or any other agency. That is correct. Yeah. Is there a list of projects for these five that, that you have available that you can share with us? Uh, I can discuss. But there's only one that is presently actively involved in an issue that relates to HUD. All the others, which I can discuss with you today, were things that we had done in the past. Uh, but the clients are still clients of ours because it's a general retainer and we're doing work for them in a variety of other areas. The, the one that relates to HUD is dealing with the uh, FHA mortgage loan limit changes, and there's some legislation in Congress right now, the Nichols-Dixon uh, legislation, uh, that we've been actively involved in. But it's fair to say that if any of these five contacted you about a HUD-related issue, you would, you would um, do your job um, looking out for their interests with HUD? Absolutely. Okay. And um, right now you're saying there's only one project? There's only one project that we are actively involved in that relates to Were there to any projects in the past that you worked on? Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm what, sorry. I guess the correction that, is, that Ms. Gage has mentioned is it's an issue that's involved. I mean, it, uh, there are a variety of different uh, things that we're doing for them, but this is one area that they have asked us to, to be involved in. Okay. Is there any um, projects that you've worked on in the past for any of these five clients or any other clients that you were on retainer in the past? Uh, that, that um, w were there any? I, I don't, I mean, I don't understand the question. If well, it, if, uh, let me say it again. I mean, uh, we've been involved in 21 clients, I mean, dealing with matters that effectively would relate to, uh, to 21 clients, the ones that I've disclosed, and, you know, the, a variety of people in the firms over the course of the life of, of the various firms have worked on those matters, yes. No, we, uh, no, I'll, you have 21 projects from the hearing and the two letters that we're aware of. But um, Riviera Beach is, uh, relates to a client that you have on retainer, correct? I, I'm sorry, I didn't. Riviera Beach is, is someone you have on retainer, is that? No, no, we, we had done some work for Mr. Wadsworth that I disclosed uh, in, uh, 
uh, in the, the Palm Beach County in West Palm Beach. And uh, we had a, a pre -ex a, an existing relationship that no longer, I mean, we're not no, any, doing any work for them any longer. But he, they had indicated to us that they had a whole dag and they asked us to check the status out. We did not expect any remuneration for that. We didn't ask for any remuneration. No, but, but, but you, were, you, know, you were getting remuneration. I can't even say the word. Remuneration. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We, are, we are not on retainer to Mr. I'll Wadsworth. I'll choose fee over it. Yeah. <laughs> We but, are not on retainer to Mr. Wadsworth. He had called us. We had done work for him in the past. We had an exist, a, a, a relationship that, uh, with him, so he knew us. We knew him. He called and asked if we would check into the Riviera Beach Hodag. Okay, and I I'm guess, led to believe we checked into that. I, this is the way I'm going to leave it with you. I would like you to give us a list of any projects you worked on on behalf of any clients who paid you a, a fee or put you on retainer. The, 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 I, I've listed all of the clients, Congressman, in the letters, but I can also list for you the projects as well. Yeah, the projects would be important to us. Um, let me just go into one other area, just with Seabrook. Um, I felt pretty much, and I thought you kind of felt it too, that uh, Seabrook was kind of a done deal. And um, I wasn't even going to bring up the whole issue of risk or not, uh, because I felt that was fairly well established. I wasn't going to beat a dead horse. But you brought it up uh, as if to imply to us that, you know, you were like anyone else. Um, you're in a very competitive environment and you took risks like anyone else. It seems to me what we've learned from, one of the things we've learned from this whole investigation is that, that a lot of them were greased. A lot of them were the, the relationships that people had. I'm not saying illegal, but, but um, people like you and your firm uh, were able to get projects that someone else might not be able to get uh, because of the relationships that you had and, uh, uh, and that it was developer driven. And I just want to, to ask you this first question. Is it your contention that Seabrook was not developer driven, that it was driven by the community or by the state of, of New Jersey? No, I, I, we initiated the project when Mr. Cruz went down there and looked at the site, Congressman. There's nothing illegal with having a project be developer driven, but let me pursue this a bit with you. You, uh, we're in, ninth, in, in February of 87, is this not true that you had your first option to buy, and in April of 87, you um, exercise, You didn't exercise your option, but you, you actually had to put down $400,000. What was the exact number? It was 10%. $425,000. down with the risk that if the project didn't go forward, you were, gonna, you were either going to lose your earnest money or you're going to buy a project that you'd even lose more on, so you're probably just going to lose your earnest money. But that was in 1987, is that not That true? is correct, Congressman, although I'd like to just correct one thing you said. Our first option agreement was not in February, it was in January. The okay. February 24th one was the second one. Okay, so January was the first one with, with, with very little down, That's or if you had to the, put something down, you could get it back. I believe the cumulative money that was exposed, and you're right, it could have been retrieved, was $25,000 between January and February 24th. Now, a document you saw last time was a letter to uh, Mr. Monticello from Mr. Connolly. Uh, the deputy director in November of 20 and it says the New Jersey Department of Community Affairs Division of Housing and Development hereby applies for 326 units of section 8 moderate rehabilitation program for Cumberland County New Jersey how many units was the um, was the Seabro project 326 okay. so in November of 20 1986 uh, you have Mr. Conley are requesting that. Is this after a meeting that, uh, that you all had with Mr. Connolly? Or? It was after a meeting that Mr. Cruz had with Mr. Ziegler. Okay. Which is an assistant to Mr. Connolly, correct? And the person who is in charge of the moderate rehabilitation program for the uh, Department of Housing and Now, Jersey. the interesting thing about this is that they requested a specific amount, obviously, and, and there's no doubt it was after the meeting that took place. Um, defense, d developer driven, we understand that. But it has blind carbon copied to um, Samuel Pierce, um, and it says, attention, Debbie Dean. Debbie, why was uh, uh, Debbie Dean um, uh, CC'd on this? Do you have any idea this is from Mr. Monticello? She would, uh, well. Did she know about the project then? Well, she, she knew about it from the conversation she had had with Mr. Gay on November 14th. Right. So, but, but what we have in, in November of 86, before you took any risk at all, we had we, 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 we've established that we had 
Deputy Dean knew about it from the central office, the chief of staff, in essence, of, of, the, um, of the secretary. And we know that now the, the state of New Jersey is applying for 326 units, you know, not 325, not 300, but that's what they're applying. In January, a memo memorandum for Mr. Monticello from Tom Demery, uh, it's, the, it's, the, it's the 185 that basically allocates uh, units for uh, New Jersey. And it says, your subject funded assignment form HUD 185 has been revised to increase moderate rehabilitation contracts authorized authority by $2,077,560 and budget authority for $31,163,400. This authority is provided for approximately 320 six units for moderate rehabilitation program administered by the New Jersey Department of Community Affairs for use in Cumberland County, New Jersey, and is to be used only for this purpose. Only for this purpose. Now that's in January uh, of, of, of um, 1987. That's when you had your first option. Is that not correct? You I don't know the date of that no, letter, no, Congressman. No, you had your uh, first option in... In, in, in early January. Uh, we had, that first option was the result of negotiations that Mr. Cruz had been conducting from, I guess, October. Um, and I don't, the exact date was right after the first of the year. I don't know the date of that letter. So. But, but what's key is, I mean, to, to get this, this is a key document, wouldn't you agree? Not the document, the fact that money from federal government has been earmarked for New Jersey. You would, you would agree this is a major hurdle. Oh, that would be a major hurdle, yes. Um, then in, um, in February, uh, you have a memorandum for Walter Johnson, manager, Newark office, from Joseph Monticello. So Mr. Monticello is given the 326 units, and it says, your subject sub-assignment of funds has been revised to reflect an increase in moderate rehabilitation of $2,077,560 in contract authority and $31,163,400 in budget authority. This authority is provided for approximately 326 units for the moderate rehabilitation program administered by the New Jersey Department of Community Affairs for use in Cumberland County, New Jersey. This, this authority may only be used for this purpose, for the purpose specified. Um, wouldn't you agree now that from New Jersey now they're earmarking it for that one area where you have 326 units, you would agree that this is a significant hurdle? Uh. I would agree that, you know, not, again, not knowing that letter, but uh, having the money go from the region to the, uh, the area is a significant hurdle. So by February, before you ever had to put down $425,000, $400, it's fairly clear that you've got HUD signing off in Washington, you've got New Jersey earmarking it, in the, excuse me, the, the, um, Mr. Monticello earmarking it for a specific area. Would you be very precise in telling me what other housing units could have applied for 326 units? Well, as I indicated, uh, actually as Mr. Cruz indicated a little while ago, the seller of the property to us had another project that would have fit the general parameters. Now, he did not have 326 units, but New I want Jersey- I know a specific project he had, because, and I want to know how many units it was. That question, uh Mr. Ashe was one of the largest. Uh, Can we spell his name? I get very nervous yes. every time All I right, hear it. All right, fine. <laughs> A C H E E, Ashe. No congressman in front of his name. Is uh, C J Ashe, okay. was one of the largest landowners and uh, rental housing uh, owners in, I guess, Upper Deerfield County. He had close to 500 units in his, uh, in his portfolio. And uh, other than the 326 units that I was negotiating with Mr. Ashe for, 326 being the subject of this inquiry, Mr. Ashe also had uh, some 135 uh, single family homes that he was using as rental units that would have been available for any uh, moderate rehab rental subsidy program should he have made the decision, and I'm not making any assumptions because I don't know what Mr. O'Shea's game plan would have been. I'm just saying that he could have applied for those units. Well, is, was there any um, 
the facility that you had was for 326. It's it's uh, it's not single family, correct? Are the, uh, the no, they, yeah. these are the these Seabrook are, project is not single. 57 family. buildings with eight units okay. in each building. Now, are you saying that were there any other uh, projects other than the 135 single family homes that could have competed with your 326? I have no knowledge of any other okay. projects. Yay or nay, Congressman? Yeah. Well, no, I don't have any other knowledge of. No, but no, but see, you all, you all are the ones who brought this up, and you really left me with the impression. And I can't tell you, I came here today fully um, looking to give you the benefit of the doubt in every instance. But it's very. I have to stretch it to give you the benefit of the doubt that your 326 units that have been earmarked for New Jersey, for Cumberland, for this area. Uh, has to fear after you all are the ones who got it. Well, let me state this specifically, Congressman. Yeah. I did not have any dealings with any of the HUD officials at any time during the Seabrook project. Well, are you, what, are you, what I can say is this. Why is that relevant? I mean, your organization. Because I want to make a point as it relates to risk. I want to make a point as it relates to Victor Cruz and the risk that I thought I was taking. Are you separating yourself from Black no, I'm not Manafort? No, I'm not taking, I'm not separating my, yes, I'm not a part of Black Manafort, Stone, and Kelly. Mm -hmm. I'm a part of CFM development. Yeah. What I'm saying is that I felt that there was a risk throughout the process as it related to the Seabrook project. There's always now, a risk throughout the project that it may not happen. Exactly. It may not happen. The key, though, is by the time you had to plunk down $425,000, it was pretty much a done deal. We and did not have the construction financing or the permanent financing until sometime in uh, November. No, we had the permanent financing before we had the construction financing. We had the construction financing sometime in the beginning of November. It was definitely a risk. Mr. Cruz, everything is a risk. But the bottom line is, in November of 86, you had already met with the Housing Authority people in, in, in uh, New Jersey. They had already written Mr. Monticello. Mr. Monticello had already written Washington. Washington had already said, you know, we want the 326 units. They didn't say 300. They didn't say 135. They said 326. I don't disagree with that. Congress. Okay. And then what they did in New Jersey is then they, they, they said, this is going to be used for the sole purposes of a small area. And your comment to us was that it could, that your 326 units could have competed with others when they advertised. And that defies my sense of logic. It seems to me by then you were pretty assured that you had been allocated 326 units. And uh, it was uh, certainly worth taking whatever risk may have remained. I was just providing you with additional facts. No, I know, but I just, I just think that, that in a sense, I wasn't going to ask what the other project was. I'm happy I did because I'm a little angry that you would say to us that um, uh, 326 units is, has to fear 135 single family homes. And then you're saying you don't know of any other potential Stone competition. So I just want to be on the record. You didn't commit any illegalities from this. It just is very clear to this committee that this is an example of a project that was developer-driven, uh, that, that in the end, the federal government spent $331 million that, and got 326 units out of it. And maybe it would have been better to let people live at $200 or $300 a unit in that project and not spend so much to provide a rehab here. And maybe if we had taken this $31 million and had it been competitive, we could have gotten more than 326 units. I mean, that's what it says to me. Mm -hmm. um, you know? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Congressman Morrison. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, I do want to um, commend the witnesses for their availability and the fact that we're getting their testimony. I, We've had some experience with people who don't want to talk, and uh, that's their right, but that was your right, too, and you've chosen to try to inform the committee, and I appreciate that. Um, I'm going to start with you, Mr. Manafort, if I might. Um, you read earlier from a March 30th letter uh, about, um, could, could you just refer to that letter again? Do we have that letter in the, uh, the record of the hearing, Mr. Chairman? 
Yeah. Okay. I think we do. Um, this letter, um, uh, you, this is the letter to Mr. Cruz, dated March 30th, 1987, from Diane Kinane. Yes, sir. I have it in front of me. Okay. And... Um, Now, how am I doing? When was the uh, when was the advertisement done? The advertisement was done, I believe, on May 18th. It was done on May 18th. Yes, sir. But on March 30th, it says that um, there's a letter from from the Department of Community Affairs that says that I anticipated a an award of moderate rehabilitation units from HUD for Seabrook within 60 days. Upon satisfaction of the mandatory HUD requirements, I believe a formal commitment units can be made to your project. I feel confident that we can enter into an agreement to enter into a housing assistance contract by June 1st, 1987. Doesn't sound very ambiguous to me. Doesn't sound like Mr. Ishe is in this play. Well, if I might, Congressman, this we had could been you, working. Could you, could you please stop? I'm sorry. The microphone. We had been working with the PHA now since. Could you get it a little closer, please? I'm sorry. We had been working with the PHA now since November of 1986. They were well aware of us and well aware of our project and agreed with the project. Uh, they agreed that the project was a good project, and that's what refers to the first two paragraphs. The second pair, and what they're telling us is that the project is indeed feasible and eligible. That's the first important fact to our firm, or to our company. Then they say that they anticipate an award within 60 days. And upon satisfaction of the mandatory HUD requirements by our application, uh, she believed a formal commitment could be made to our project. Uh, it doesn't say could. Well, it says can. I I'm feel confident we can enter can. into an agreement. It, 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 I only said could because in the context of my, my speech, but it says can be made. Uh, that is not a commitment on her part to make it because she couldn't commit to it, uh, and we understood that. Uh, it then says that I feel confident that we can enter into an agreement to enter into a housing assistance contract by June 1. In fact, we didn't enter into one until October 8th, but that's irrelevant. Uh, so this letter did give us a degree of confidence, absolutely. But as she said, if we satisfied the mandatory HUD requirements, which included, among other things, the advertisement, I want to know, why are you guys struggling so hard against the obvious fact? I mean, the obvious fact that any jury that was listening to this um, would conclude, that any common sense person would conclude, is that starting in November 14th, when Mr. Gay met with Deborah Dean, this has gone through a series of decisions where the clear intention was that your project was going to get funded. Everybody in the play had that intention, including you, for good reason. It was your project. That's what you wanted it to be. Everybody along the way is writing these very clear documents that are targeted to your project. And all of a sudden, you want to say there was some ambiguity. Now, as some, why is it that you want to try so hard to convince us that there's ambiguity rather than certainty? Do you understand there to be something wrong with that certainty? Congressman, I'm, we're trying to provide you with our frame of mind during this process. And that was our frame of mind. Now, you may have a lot more confidence, as I said, looking at it backwards. But looking at it from those points in time forward, we had concerns. And we tried to do everything we could. Uh, to make sure the project was eligible, which this letter says it was, and would meet the mandatory HUD requirements, which it ultimately did. So in hindsight, yes, everything looks very neat. The course of pro the, the actions taking place, our mindset might be subjective, but our mindset, we were concerned about certain, el certain areas which I've enumerated here today. Okay. Um, Mr. Uh, Mr. Cruz, um, Mr. Connolly, testified about a meeting that you had with Mr. Ziegler at the uh, Department of Com Community Affairs, I believe, on, uh, in November 1986. Do you recall having that meeting? I certainly do, Congressman. And uh, Mr. Connolly's testimony was that um, they, meaning 
your firm, mm -hmm. uh, indicated they had a commitment from HUD for the Seabrook project. Is Mr. Connolly correct? Absolutely not. So you gave no indication of a commitment from HUD? Well, the first thing is that Mr. Con I never met with Mr. Connolly. I met with Mr. Mr. Connolly Ziegler. doesn't say you met with him. He says you, you met with Mr. Ziegler. Well, I didn't. I met with Mr. Ziegler, and what I indicated to Mr. Ziegler was that through my knowledge as being the Deputy Commissioner of Housing, that there were Section 8 moderate rehab units that would be available from the discretionary fund. I mean, I, I am just as much a practitioner as Mr. Connolly or Mr. Ziegler was, and I was aware that there were available units, and I was there to ask him to apply for those units. Now, as to, for both of you, where did the $450,000 come from? What kind of payment was this? Where, what kind of money? Was this cash? Was it put up? Was yes, it cash? Sir. Yes, sir. It was cash. And, and was uh, this uh, borrowed somewhere? It wasn't a letter of credit? Or no, how, was, it, how was this money uh, it, obtained? It, it was borrowed and submitted, uh, in, I, I believe, in escrow to Mr. Auger. We can't hear you, Mr. Manchester. It was The I'm money sorry. was borrowed and, uh, and wired to Mr. Auger. And who borrowed the money? The joint venture. CFM? C, well, at that point, CFM and CDC. Jointly? Who, was, was anyone personally liable on that, that note? Uh, I believe we were all personally liable to the extent of our participation in the joint venture. So that CFM would have been liable for 60 percent, CDC, I believe, would have been liable for 40 percent, and then on the CFM side, we would have respectively been responsible for 20 percent of it. Was this secured in any other way? I don't recall if we signed, uh, signed personal guarantees or not, Congressman. Who was this money borrowed from? Uh, I, I'd have to go back. CDC handled that transaction. Okay. Could you please produce the, um, yes, the documentation of the, yes, of the loan? Thank you. Um, now, at, um, Who, um, is Mr. Cruz, I guess the question goes to, Mr. Cruz, were you involved in the setting of rent levels for the Seabrook project? No, I was not, Congressman. Who was involved in that? Uh, CDC was the, the PHA submitted the rent increase information through the HUD office, but CDC was the technical entity that uh, worked on that. I was not involved in that process. Uh, Mr. Manafort, do you have any involvement with, um, the, um, the setting of the rent levels? S the setting of the rent levels, uh, Congressman, were by the, the market survey that was done, certified by the PHA and approved ultimately by, are you talking the exception rents or are you talking the? Exception rents. Yes, okay. Uh, the process was that uh, the PHA certified a market survey that went to HUD. HUD approved it. It, uh, it authorized PHA to enter into the exception rent contract. And, uh, and that then was given to the developer. Yeah, what Mr. was your... Effort, I do have to ask you to pull the mic close to you. We cannot hear you. I'm sorry. So please, please get as close as you can and speak into it. Now, that was the process. Yes, Did, sir. You're aware of that process because you've reviewed it or because you were aware of it at the time? Uh, I'm aware of it more completely now because I've reviewed it. I don't know what my recollection was in totality at the time. I understand fair market rent exceptions much better today than I'm sure I did back then. Now, who was, was, was anyone from the, from the development team involved in that process? Who were the human beings, not the partnerships, but who were the human beings who were involved in that process, if the, any, the, on the, the development side? The human beings that would have been involved in that process would have been uh, some individuals from CDC, probably Mr. Greenblatt and Mr. Beers. Um, uh, and then we would have been involved in the sense of talking back and forth, and, uh, and, my, and I would have been involved probably in dealing with people in my firm. Did you or anyone in your firm uh, have contact with anyone at HUD with respect to the setting of these levels? Uh, I believe Mr. Gay did, sir, yes. And, um, all right, well then, uh, we're going to go around again with Mr. Gay. I'll wait to ask Mr. Gay about that. We'll take a five-minute recess after you finish this questioning. Then we'll begin with Mr. Gay and Mr. Davis. Okay, well then, I'll wait and ask Mr. Gay about that. Um, Mr. Manafort, um, you were shown some uh, 
um, the documents about the, the the Bridgeport project and the notes, and that was a that was Mr. Cruz's project. Is that, that correct? Is, that is correct, sir. Uh, what was your relationship, your business relationship to Mr. Cruz with respect to those projects? Uh, that that was a proposal of Mr. Cruz's, and I had no relationship. He had asked me what the policy was, and I had set him up with people at uh, at HUD for him to discover the policy and to develop his proposal. Why did you use Deborah Dean as the contact for a sale of public housing? Well, one of the initial questions was a policy question as well as how HUD would handle it and I assumed that she would be able to pull together the appropriate people who could discuss this concept. Was it, was, was it your routine practice to start with Deborah Dean when you made uh, contacts with HUD? I, I, my, that was my only uh, contact with Deborah Dean to start a project like that, sir. I don't know that I had a routine. Uh, it is not unusual for us to deal with chiefs of staff or executives to the secretary uh, to get into a, a department or an agency where we don't understand where it is, where the pro process might determine it. So you don't think there was anything special about uh, Deborah Dean's role in any of this? You, you didn't... It was not unusual. It would, I don't think it's unusual for someone to contact the chief of staff. No, I, I, don't, I understand that. I'm really asking you about HUD. Did you, did, you, made, you had many dealings with HUD. You had 21 separate uh, clients that you've disclosed with respect to dealing with HUD. Um, in how many of those cases did you deal with Deborah Dean? We'd have to, I, I personally, uh, you know, other than the, the, uh, this matter and in a sense the Seabrook matter, cannot recall uh, any directly, but uh, you know, we, there are a number of projects where there's some contact with her that I believe uh, Mr. Gay will be prepared to talk about. Okay, now you have um, sent a letter dated um, July 18th um, disclosing, this is a, your supplemental letter disclosing the various um, clients had worked on HUD projects. Now, when you, you, you have said that this is complete as far as you know. I mean, that now with the earlier disclosures and with this, uh, you believe that you've told us everything. Is that right? Yes, sir. Now, when you say you've told us everything, does this include partnerships where only one of the members of your firm, for instance, is as you are in, in CFM, one member is involved? Um, but uh, it's not directly partnership business? I bl well, the one... I, I the one, mean firm business. Yes, it's not it, I mean business. Black Manafort Stone Kelly right. business. I, I'm even saying Black Manafort Stone, I'm referring to as the firm and the partnerships. Various of you have partnership relationships, as you do in CFM, right. that are not directly part of the, yes. of the yeah. firm. I, I cannot speak, Congressman, to Con uh, Mr. Kelly, who has a law firm in Hartford, Connecticut, and uh, you know, has a participation in that law firm. I don't know what activities that law firm has, if any. So but I that's can't, not included in this discussion. That is not well. Not, that is not included. What is included in this discussion, Congressman? If I, I can frame it better this way, is the, the Black Manafort Stone and Kelly, Black Manafort Stone, which was the predecessor company, which was a co political consulting company, uh, and. Uh, the, the couple of real estate companies that the individuals who are principals in Black Manfred Stone and Kelly have had, one that is participant in an office building that we have and things like that. Um, the only thing I can't speak to is Mr. Kelly in his outside law firm activities. So as far as you know, real estate partnerships and other the like that are not the same as Black That's Manafort, right. so they're included here? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, if you just refer to, to the letter, I have four specific questions I want to, four areas I specifically want to ask you about. Uh, first on page three, in the second full paragraph, starting in 1984, referring to <coughs> services on behalf of Colonial Realty. Yes, sir. Can you tell me um, what those services were and what the matters were that you referred to? Uh, yes, Colonial Realty is a company that is based in my, or was based at that time in my hometown, my original hometown, New Britain, Connecticut. And the principals of that company uh, uh, and I knew each other, and in a sense had a, I would call it a personal relationship. They approached me regarding a matter uh, that, uh, where they had Section 8 subsidy for some units in, in I believe, Waterbury, a project called Fairmont Heights, 
and they were looking for additional HUD funds to make improvements on the existing property. Uh, and that is, that is the principal manner which I am referring to, that uh, we agree, I agreed to help them and we helped them and uh, ultimately the, the funds were granted. Additional rehabilitation funds, yes, is that what you're saying? Is, is, is that it? You used the word several yeah, words. That, that was what they came to us on. That was the only one that, uh, that was pursued. They asked, me to, they asked me to inquire on a waiver that would allow an increase in an ACC that they already had that was necessitated by an extended delay in construction due to processing errors. And, Where was that located? Uh, uh, I believe that was also in Waterbury, Connecticut. Uh, and I don't believe that waiver was ever allowed. Did you have any involvement with the Church Street South project in that was Haven? The, that was the third one I was about to mention. They asked us to make an inquiry at HUD to determine if there are any programs or funds that were available uh, that could be used to bring the Church Street project up to HUD quality, housing quality standards. Uh, we recommended a meeting between HUD technical staff and them and they decided they didn't want to pursue it. Um, okay, let me move on to um, to the next paragraph. Um, you s say that uh, this r relates to 64 mod rehab units um, uh, in the city of Waterbury. And then you say in that year, the Fairfax Street Partnership. Uh, is this paragraph all about one deal? Is yes, this sir. one deal? And the yes, $47,000 received from Sherman Cooper. Yes, sir. Sherman Cooper was your client. Uh, yes, sir. Sherman Cooper was a developer. Yes, sir. Uh, the Waterbury Housing Authority was not your client. No, the Waterbury Housing Authority was not our client. They had a, uh, as I believe, I believe a pending application, but they were not our client. Next paragraph. Um, you speak about the National Housing Renewal Corporation. Yes, sir. This, this uh, was set up to do TPAs. Is that what it is, transfer that, of physical assets? Among other things, yes, that was what it was set up to do. And it did one TPA project that it required HUD approval. And where was that? Uh, that was the uh, Linda Poland Memorial Apartments, which is a Washington, D.C. project. And finally, um, along that line, um, in, um, in the, next, the first paragraph on the next page, you say that um, in addition, we have further established that in July 1986, the firm contacted HUD in support of a pending request for 94 mod rehab units submitted by the Housing Authority of the City of Waterbury. Who was your client? Uh, we were working uh, on behalf of some clients of Mr. Burns, who was a Connecticut-based housing consultant, but he had the direct relationship with the developer in that instance. So you were working for Mr. Burns? Uh, I won't say we were working for him, but I, he, we were working with him, I guess, is the best way to put it. Okay. Now, well, why don't you tell me who Mr. Burns is? Um, as I understand it, he is a housing consultant in Connecticut. I do not know Mr. Burns personally. You don't know him? No, I do not. Uh, is this the only time you've ever worked with him? Uh, I believe that the Waterbury 84 project, which we just referred to, was also a project in which he was involved. And you work with him in that connection? Not me personally, but the firm, yes. Who brought Mr. Burns to your firm? Uh, I believe that was Mr. Kelly was contacted by, uh, uh, I believe it was Mr. Phelps or Mr. O'Connor. I'm not sure whom. I'm sorry, why don't you Mr. just... Mr. Phelps or Mr. Mr. Kelly, meaning Peter Kelly? Peter Kelly. Kelly. Who was not, not, that the 1984 was not a member of your firm, No, right? that is correct. But Peter Kelly is somebody who several members of the firm, including myself, you know, had had a long-standing relationship with personally. Okay, now so Mr. Professionally. Peter Kelly brought um, Mr. Burns. Uh, he, I believe he spoke to either Mr. Phelps or Mr. O'Connor, I'm not sure which, uh, who were dealing with Mr. Burns to, uh, to our attention. Why don't you uh, tell me who Mr. Phelps and Mr. O'Connor are? Mr. Phelps was a special assistant to uh, Larry Simon when he was the FHA commissioner in the Carter administration. Uh, and was in private consulting business at this time. Uh, and Mr. O'Connor wa was the, I believe, the executive director of the Connecticut Housing Finance Agency at this, at this time, or was leaving there at that time. Both of them, at this, uh, uh, Mr. both of them ultimately were also participants in the National Housing Renewal Corporation matter, which you raised with me a few minutes ago. Both Mr. O'Connor and Mr. Phelps? Right. Originally Mr. Phelps and uh, ultimately Mr. O'Connor. Who else were partners in that firm? In that, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Black, 
Mr. Panuzio, Mr. Stone, and Mr. Kelly. And that, that uh, partnership engaged in matters other than the single HUD transaction that you're talking about here? It actually did two, uh, two projects. Um, the other one was a private transaction, uh, not in Connecticut and not in, and not in Washington. I don't remember where. Uh, and it was looking to do other projects, but with the change in the tax laws in 1985, eminent, the, the, val the purpose of the company lost its value. Now, um, these, uh, these other gentlemen that you've referred to, Mr. Phelps and Mr. O'Connor, um, how were they involved in the, uh, in the Waterbury projects? They were the ones working with Mr. Burns and who were aware of the various developers. We did not have any local community contact in these instances that I'm aware of. Um, okay, Mr. Cruz, um, could you um, just tell us uh, first, uh, when, when did you first become the Deputy Commissioner of Housing in Connecticut? I became the Deputy, Deputy Commissioner of Housing in January of 1981. And what, what did you do before you had that position? I was the uh, legislative liaison for the University of Connecticut as well as the Assistant Director of Development. Was Prior to that, I was uh, uh, the Labor Relations Representative for a General Motors plant in Bristol, New Departure Hyatt. And prior to that, I was a law student. Was this the first housing-related job you had? Yes, it was. I mean, and Deputy Commissioner of Housing? Yes. Yes, that was the first housing-related job. And you were there for until 1985, is that correct? No, I was there until April of 1986. April 1986. Now, um, you are your principal in this CFM yes, partnership. Yes, I am. This is a partnership? No, it's a corporation. Corporation. What is, do you have a title? Uh, I'm the vice president and the treasurer. And um, is that a salaried position? It should be, Congressman, but uh, <laughs> there's not much money flowing at this particular point in time. Do you have another professional position in addition to this? Uh, I have done some consultant work in housing areas. Yes, I have. So you work as an independent consultant also? Yes, I have. I mean, is that what you do in addition to being CFM? That's correct. Are you involved in any other similar partnership to CFM? Uh, no, I'm not involved in any particular partnerships, but there are other projects that CFM development is involved in. Yeah, but you, you draw your income from that as a, as a principal and sharing in the profits of that corporation as opposed to being paid That's salaries? Correct. You're talking about CFM? Yes. Yes. Now, the, um, the Bridgeport projects that I referred to earlier that the two memos were about. Did that, um, did that project go forward? No, it did not. Why it wasn't, not? Uh, Congressman, it was a proposal. It was something that I thought of as it related to the problems that were taking place in Bridgeport relative to these two projects. I thought that it would be uh, in the best interest of the project because of all the problems to privatize the pro project. I think it was at that time that HUD was considering privatization as one of the ways in which to handle the difficult problems of managing public housing. And so I put that proposal together. Now, with whom did you work in Connecticut putting that together? Uh, I worked with uh, CDC uh, and with uh, Mr. Richard Weaver Bay. What was the position of the Connecticut Housing Authority with respect to that project? Uh, the Connecticut Housing Authority was the administering, the administering agent for HUD of that project and, uh, and the managing uh, entity for that project. Well, I mean, that, that was a, a HUD-financed local public housing project, which had previously been a state-financed project, correct? Uh, the Connecticut Housing Authority is not really a local housing authority. Well, it's a project. statewide housing That's authority correct. that provides housing authority services, as you explained earlier. That's correct. Uh, for new, in, like in New Jersey, it provides, it's the local housing authority where there isn't a local housing authority, That's exactly that right? correct, yes. So its role there, it, it was the owner of these projects. They had previously been state financed. That's correct. They were, they were transferred to, to federally financed with funds for rehabilitation, isn't that right? That's correct. And that's where you entered the picture. Uh, that had all been done before you made these suggestions. That's correct. Now my question is, was this a project that the 
that the Connecticut Housing Authority was asking you to do, or were you doing this on your own? And what was the contact between you and them on these? I had submitted a letter to uh, Commissioner Joseph E. Canale, who was the uh, Commissioner for the Connecticut Housing Authority, as well as the Commissioner for the State Department of Housing. I had submitted a letter to him indicating my interest in the privatization program as well. Uh, but it was all proposal form at that particular point. So in other words, had you discussed it with Mr. Canale? I certainly had. Had he said he wanted to do this? Uh, to be quite frank with you, Congressman, he was skeptical of my uh, chances to get privatization from HUD in this uh, particular case. But if uh, I was able to convince uh, HUD that the privatization route would have been the best route, I think that uh, uh, Commissioner Kennelly would have been very much interested in it. I have no further questions. Before we break, the uh, Chair has a couple of questions. Uh, according to the New York Times, Ms. Manafort, you had a meeting with Deborah Dean on December 11, 1986. Can you tell us about that meeting? I don't think that meeting ever took place, Congressman. It never took place. I don't have any records that it took place. I, I don't recall it happening, and I read it in the newspaper as well and uh, made some inquiry, and I could not find any basis that uh, that meeting had happened. And, and I can't remember why it was scheduled, to be honest with you. Have you ever visited the Seabrook project? I know, sir. After our previous hearing, during the course of which you indicated you never visited it prior to that time? That is correct. Have we not piqued your curiosity to take a look at it? Congressman, since the last uh, time I testified, I have been traveling quite a bit and have been out of the country most of the time mm -hmm. on business. The reason I'm asking it is because you have sort of repeatedly indicated great pride in the project. And the people who visit the project uh, come to the opposite conclusion. And I'm wondering if you have any plans now to visit the project. I do, but I can't tell you a date certain. Okay. Committee will stand in recess for five minutes. Subcommittee will, will resume. <coughs> Chair understands Mr. Manafort would like to uh, expand on one of his answers. Happy to hear from you, Ms. Manafort. Yes, Congressman, I, I didn't complete a statement I was making when Congressman Shea asked me if... Uh, could you pull the mic? Sorry. I, I didn't complete a statement when Congressman Shea's asked me about the employees at, uh, at Black Manafort, Stone & Kelly who might have worked at HUD. I indicated Mr. Gay had been a consultant. Additionally, Mr. Davis, before he went to the White House, was a consultant to HUD. And Mr. Andre Latand, who's an employee of, of Black Manafort, Stone & Kelly, also was a consultant to HUD in approximately 1985. As best of my knowledge, that's the complete list of people who are presently employees of Black Manafort, Stone & Kelly, who worked at HUD previously. I will uh, ultimately give to the committee a list of any BMS and K employees who are presently working at HUD. Thank, Thank you for the opportunity. Mr. Davis, uh, when did you work at the White House and what were your duties and responsibilities? I came to work at the White House in August of 1985. Um, my duties and responsibilities included coordination. I worked in the Office of Cabinet Affairs as an Associate Director of Cabinet Affairs. And my duties and responsibilities included coordination with a number of uh, domestic cabinet agencies and uh, coordinating the policy development and the communication between those agencies in the White House and vice versa. How much of your work entailed relations with HUD? HUD was one of five cabinet agencies, and I had also about eight other sub-cabinet level agencies that I worked with. When you were, and how, how long did you work at the White House? Uh, approximately 18 months. I left in uh, March of 1987. 
When you were interviewed by subcommittee staff, you stated that at no time did you send a project to HUD requesting that it be funded. Um, you were also quoted in the New York Times of August 31 as saying, quote, we'd never push or shove, end quote. Is this true? Congressman, I think for the purposes of what we're trying to accomplish today, I think it's important for you to understand um, a fundamental policy that existed in the White House and certainly applied to me in the Office of Cabinet Affairs. Uh, my boss, the Secretary of the Cabinet, and uh, Who was that? Mr. Al Kingan, mm -hmm. and certainly the Chief of Staff, Mr. Don Regan, made it abundantly clear that none of us working in the Cabinet Office, certainly me included, were to be involved in the selection and determination of any specific projects in any agency obviously including HUD. But Deborah Dean told the grand jury that the White House had intervened in at least a quarter of the successful grant applications. What's your comment on that? Congressman, I haven't had any access to the grand jury testimony of Ms. Dean, um, nor should I feel I should comment on, on that at this time unless I saw it. Did you have access to the New York Times? Certainly, Congressman. What is your comment about the New York Times article on this subject? Well, I'd rather not speculate on I'm newspaper stories. I'm not asking stories. you to speculate. I ask you to give me your comment. On sure. It. And my comment would be that I don't feel that I recall any instance that would have described that, uh, what Ms. Dean was talking about. Um, and there were other people also at the White House involved in, in HUD agencies. I'm, I don't feel it's my determination on that. Who else would have contacted Ms. Dean from the White House other than yourself? The uh, organization of the White House to some degree is a, a mere image uh, in many respects to the organization of a cabinet agency. Uh, they have the uh, Office of Intergovernmental Affairs, which also mirrors that of uh, HUD, the uh, Legislative Affairs Office, which also mirrors that of HUD. Uh, although the OMB staff is not considered a part of the White House staff, uh, they, for our purposes today, I suspect could be. And they certainly have direct budget uh, uh, line responsibilities in those agencies. So I, I think the point I'm trying to make is there are a number of groups in the White House that may have at any time routinely contacted HUD for any kind of issues. Mr. Gay, when were you at HUD and what work did you perform? I went to HUD in uh, December of 1984. Sorry? December 1984 when I started at HUD. 